Hey, 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 how we doing? Or should I say, hello there. Welcome back to another stream, everyone. Hope everyone's doing good. Hope everyone's had a pretty sick uh, week. Well, last week now, technically. I hope everyone had a good one. Uh, me, myself, it was a bit better than a week before, so can't complain. Can't complain. And uh, we've got quite a bit to talk about today if i'm honest with you obviously the main um idea of the stream is going to be going through the bad batch what we saw last episode what we think we're going to see this week uh predictions theories a little bit of speculation here there and everywhere but we've also got quite a bit of other star wars news to talk about as well um both in star wars both with disney um and some cool bits and pieces to watch so should be a good one in fact let me take a look and see what is officially on today's uh, list yeah so we've got some uh, interesting interesting information regarding uh disney and uh, acquisition of lucasfilm star wars and jenna jones willow um some updates on the new jedi order movie and some acolyte stuff uh yeah so it's a bit of a wild one really bit of a bit of a, a random one <laughs> finally here to catch a live stream with a just star wars fam how is everyone i know friendly man um it's been a while but i hope you're doing good and uh, i'm doing good myself and uh, it's good to see you bud absolutely good to see you now before we um well before we actually got into the stream just now it actually dawned on me that we've not actually watched uh star wars outlaws the gameplay trailer together we've not even spoke about it to be honest with you so i thought what i'll do is pop that up have a little look and uh yeah see what's going on see what you guys think about it uh see if there's anything we can pick out just to warm us up before we get into uh get into the juice and trust me there's some uh there's some juicy bits going on tonight in the in the uh in the nice way anyway well depends depends what side you're on right let's uh let's chatty chatty more watchy watchy yeah each of you represents some of the most powerful criminal organizations in the galaxy pikes crimson dawn <coughs> huts it's a golden age for the underworld the Empire controls every corner of the galaxy, but they're distracted by a rebellion that won't quit. It's an opportunity to make millions. Kay Vess, the underworld's favorite new scoundrel. Ah. We meet at last. What do you want? Zarek Besh, their new, rich, and lethal. Zerk Besh. You crossed their boss, Slero. And now, he wants you gone. Rob his fortune, buy your freedom. This job, it's a death wish. Oh, Ami boy. I'm my boy. I'm in. Out here, you live and die by your reputation. You want to survive? Know the players. Hey, you're new to this world. What's your problem? Come back when you're not. Daba, right? Look, don't Hot try anything. Movie. I got a whole thing surrounding the... Okay, we're skipping that part. For about as long as I can remember, it's just been me and Nyx. Doing what we have to, to survive. This job is my one shot at freedom. But if we're gonna pull this off, we need the right crew. And the right ship. Because you are one of the best hunters in the Outer Rim. She's more connected than you let on, Slero. Bess is mixed up in something bigger. The Outer Rim is a dangerous place. Everyone is fighting for their piece of the galaxy. But all I want is to live free. So I'm gonna risk it all. Star Wars Outlaws pre So I've um yeah I mean I did, 
kind of did watch it as it came out, but not really. I didn't pay much attention to it. Just kind of glanced at it, if I'm honest, because I always plan to uh, watch it on a stream. Um, it kind of strikes me of the bat there, kind of a mixture between uh, the story of the Book of Boba Fett and the story of Solo, the, the movie. Each of you Let's kind of represents some of the most powerful criminal organizations a little bit more. in the galaxy. But these are the I new guys then, right? Crimson Dawn. Trying to pull everyone together, very much Boba Fett vibes when he became the Tamu of Tatooine. The underworld. The Empire controls every corner of the galaxy, but they're distracted by a rebellion that won't quit. So it's quite it's clear that it's set between me. episodes five and six. His hands in the carbonite. Hey, Vess, the underworld's favorite new scoundrel. Ah. We meet at last. What do you want? Zarek Besh, their new, rich, Derek and lethal. Besh. You crossed their boss, Sliro, and now he wants you gone. Rob his fortune, buy your freedom. This job, it's a death wish. I'm in. Out here, you live and die by your reputation. Die by your reputation. That looks pretty much like Tatooine, doesn't it? With the uh, twin sons. You want to survive? Know the players. You're new to this world. What's your problem? Come back when you're not. Daba, right? Look, don't try anything. I got a whole crew surrounding the. Okay, we're skipping that part. For about as long as I can remember, it's just been me and Nick. Just been me and Nick, and remember? The okay, we're skipping that. No bib? Yeah, there's bib. For about as long as I can remember, it's just been me and Nick's. Doing what we have to to survive. This job is so my she one work shot at freedom. Just try and take down but the new we're guys. we're gonna pull this off, we need the right crew. And the right ship. Our right crew, white right ship. That's very solo vibes. Yes. Come on. I hire you because you are one of the best hunters in the Outer Rim. She's more connected than you let on, Slero. Bess is mixed up in something bigger. The Outer Rim is a dangerous place. Everyone is fighting for their piece of the galaxy. But all I want is to live free. So I'm gonna risk it all. Hold on, Dick! Star Wars Outlaws pre-order available now. Yeah, so one thing I heard about this game as well is um, apparently you don't get the full game when you buy it. Like you have to pay for add-ons and and uh, all that jazz as well, which uh, which ain't great if I'm honest with you. If you want to buy a game, you want to get the full shebang. Now I don't know the ins and outs of it, so I won't dive too deep and pretend I do. Um, but that that's the general consensus of what I've gathered online there. Um, overall, looking at the story trailer, it reminds me very much of Solo. Um, vibes of the Book of Boba Fett in terms of the actual story. Uh, of course, that's kind of expected. They're both kind of underworld type shows, right? One thing that does, because I know I didn't actually see her in the trailer, um, but I saw screenshots of apparently Kira from Solo playing a part in this being part of Crimson Dawn. That leads me to think that is there a possibility no, there wouldn't be with that. I was going to say more, but more was, uh, he's gone. He's gone at this point, but a second time round. Um, yeah, so I don't know. I'll, will I get the game? Uh, yeah, probably. I'll, I'll play it. I'll give it a go. Um, it looks like it could be fun. The fact it's open world is good as well. Um, with that being said, I don't think it's going to stack up as well as Jedi Survivor, Jedi Fallen Order. People just love playing as a 
as a, a force sensitive lightsaber wielder of any kind, of any variety. You know, if you can do some tricks and smash around a lightsaber blade, it just makes the whole experience more enjoyable. We'll see how it goes. We'll see how it goes. So there's potential there. Um, but yeah, as it stands, I don't think it will do as well as the Jedi games, but we'll see. We'll see. Uh, mid outlaws i never got past five minutes for solo fair uh, fair old derpy that's a that's a fair assessment my friend now okay moving on from outlaws okay i wanted to go through something let me just pop it up here now a lot of you online you know if you've been on twitter or watching other youtube videos streams uh the rest of it now you might have quite like me up until today at least when i came across this thought that Star Wars, the sequel trilogy under Disney and the spin-off movies pretty much made Disney their money back and they're sitting on a pretty profit and it's all money, money, money for them because it's just printing the stuff, you know, especially the sequels, massive box office successes and the rest of it. Um, well, actually, that is uh, awkwardly not the case. So um, over on Forbes, They've got an article up and it's titled Disney Star Wars box office profits fail to cover cost of buying Lucasfilm. Now you're probably scratching your head like I was reading this thinking, well, how could that be? You know, Lucasfilm was, what was it, just over 4 billion? What was it, 4.3 billion, something like that? Um, not too, I can't remember the exact number there. Um, but then like The Force Awakens alone like pretty much recouped half of that. So how could they be failing to actually cover the cost of purchasing Lucasfilm in the first place. Well, uh, let's take a look and hopefully it will shed some light on it for you. And I found it very surprising and very eye-opening as well with the uh, the current situation they probably find themselves in uh, behind the scenes. So, um, it goes on to say, and this is quite a lengthy one, so we'll try and skim through it as best as we can and make sense of it. Box office profits generated by Disney Star Wars movies have fallen 2.8 billion short of covering the media giant's purchase of the sci-fi saga creator Lucasfilm, according to analysis um, of recently filed financial statements. So, Disney brought Lucasfilm for 4 billion in 2012 and soon gave the green light to a new trilogy of Star Wars movies, which teamed up rising stars Daisy Ridley and John Boyega, um, not, mentioning, not mentioning their um, Oscar Isaac, uh, with Mark Hamill, Harrison Ford, and the late Carrie Fisher, who headlined the original movies 30 years, uh, more than 30 years earlier. Now, all the stars aligned when The Force Awakens, the first film in the new series, was released in 2015. According to industry analyst Box Office Mojo, it grossed a staggering $2.1 billion, causing Disney to commission two spin-off movies, being Solo and Rogue One, and the two sequels that were already in development and already in the pipeline already planned. However, as the series continued, there was a disturbance in the force due to an over-reliance on computer-generated effects and a lack of the gritty, quirky characters who made the original movies such a smash hit. Now, I have to say, I disagree. I disagree with that. I feel... I feel like, um, well, I actually, I can say I've, I've not really seen any uh, kind of backlash from the sequel trilogy due to their reliance on computer generated effects. I've not really seen that. Uh, if anything, they took a step back uh, from what George did with the, with the prequels, you know, um, with all the green screen. They were more on sets. They did go more puppets rather than CGI, especially with The Force Awakens. Um, so I don't know where Forbes got that idea from. Now, in 2019, The Rise of Skywalker, the third installment of the original trilogy, uh, sorry, of the new trilogy, pulled in around a half as much at the box office as The Force Awakens. Though the series soon had a renaissance uh, just a few weeks before the first case of COVID when Mandalorian dropped on Disney+. Plus. It was an instant success thanks to the unlikely pairing of its protagonists. The series is named uh, after a gruff armor-clad bounty hunter played by Pedro Pascal, but we know how the Mandalorian goes, I guess. But um, yeah, photos of the cute character went viral because of its resemblance to beloved Star Wars sage Yoda. Um, so we, we know the story with the Mandalorian. Um, the Mandalorian was watched more than any other show, and according to Nielsen, racked up 5.4 billion minutes of viewing time during its initial seven-week run, peaking at 1.2 billion during the week its finale, the final episode, aired. It just didn't appeal to fans, but also critics as, critics as well. 
So it got 92% ratings on review aggregator Rotten Tomato, and it got a host of different awards. So it got, what, six Primetime Emmy Awards and 42 Primetime Creative Arts Emmy Awards, winning in 15 categories. So it was an absolute smash. Um, and yeah, it's going to be hard for Disney to top that with anything, surely. Uh, we'll have to wait and see. So what does this mean in terms of Disney and what they paid for Lucasfilm and the money they've made back since then? So. Uh, the decline in interest in Disney's initial trilogy of movies seems like a distant memory, and the mouse has made the most of it. Last month, Disney released a 67-page presentation singing the praises of its chief executive, Bob Iger, in the bid to convince stockholders to side with him in a battle with active, um, activist investors. So one of its key boasts was about the supposedly spellbinding return on investment generated by the franchises that Disney acquired under Iger. So that would be, um, you know... Star Wars, Marvel, the rest of it. Presentation gives the impression that Disney's Star Wars trilogy generated a 2.9 times return on the purchase of Lucasfilm, as that figure is presented next to the timeline of key events in the production company's history. That's all how it appears on paper. It's kind of misleading, if anything. They include the release of the Disney movies and its acquisition of Lucasfilm, which is the only milestone marked with a star. Adding to this impression is the fact that the other end of the timeline is the Star Wars logo and a photo of the Mandalorian with his little green friend. However, buried in the fine print, where all the juicy details always are, is the revelation that the purchase price of Lucasfilm isn't even included in the return of investment, the ROI calculation. Instead, it's purely based on the box office performance of Disney's Star Wars trilogy, its two spin-off movies, merchandise TV, and uh, Blu-ray sales. So they're, they're putting out this figure, essentially, and it's, um, it's basically that they're, they're giving us or, or they're declaring the, the, the full income from, from what they've put out there, not the profit. They're not actually deducting what they actually cost them to buy a Lucasfilm. So as revealed, the methodology is questionable as Disney based the return of investment on the revenue generated by the movies, merch, DVDs, Blu-rays, rather than the profit they made as it should have done. Using the revenue rather than the profit artificially inflates the result as it doesn't factor in the costs that Disney had to pay out. Even uh, this wasn't enough for the media giant, so it also forecasts the revenue that is expected the Star Wars movies, merch, DVDs, yada, 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 to generate over a 10-year period and base the calculation on that too. In other words, Disney hasn't actually received the revenue that it used to calculate the return on its investment. Uh, it's hypothet hypothetical. They're kind of estimating how they expect it to go the uh you know in today's climate where movies at the moment in the box office you know the really successful ones are few and far between at this point in time you can't be a sure bet on anything at this point to be honest and especially as the star wars movies have been out of cinemas since 2019 how do they know how the audiences are going to react uh going back in they don't so uh, that's kind of crazy in summary, despite seeming to do so, um, Disney's presentation doesn't actually reveal whether its Star Wars movies have covered the cost of its purchase to Lucasfilm. There may be good reason for this. Analysis of more than 800 pages of company filings has revealed that the cost of making Disney's Star Wars movies hit a total of $2.1 billion, peaking at $567.3 million on The Force Awakens. However, that's just the start. Mindful of this blockbuster budget, Disney devised an ingenuous way to make money back on the movie. Instead of shooting it in the United States, it chose Pinewood Studios over in the UK, where I am. Um, where, well, in the UK, I'm not actually at Pinewood Studios, where the original trilogy of films was made. This enabled it to benefit from the UK government's audiovisual expenditure credit, which gives studios a cash reimbursement of up to 25.5% of the money they spend in the UK providing that it represents, uh, represents at least 10% of the film's total costs. And I think this is still something they're doing as well. There's nothing wrong with them doing this, of course. Um, but I think this is still something they're doing as well, especially with some of the newer shows, the newer movies, and, um, and even some of the Disney Plus projects, by the sounds of it. They're bringing it over to the UK to get some of that cash back to lower their costs, which is uh, totally understandable. So uh, it just goes into detail just here about uh, how the scheme kind of works. Uh, where are we going to get the good stuff? Uh, just here. Yeah, nope, nope, nope. It's talking about code names and basically, essentially, all it's saying here um, through this section is explaining, you know, 
what happened when they worked in the UK, um, and that each production, so for example, The Force Awakens or you know The Last Jedi or Solo, The Mandalorian, they all they all come under their own company. Um, so it's paid out like that. It's just giving you the ins and outs of it, which isn't important to the bottom line, if I'm honest with you. Okay, so. Um, Here we go. Yeah, we'll start back here. Why not? Disney spent a total of two hundred and ninety-eight point seven million making Rogue One, which is a tremendous gamble as it largely featured little-known actors. Though it paid off with a healthy profit, um, and it could have been even more, as the filings for the movie state that the final cost was higher than the agreed budget. Um, so Rogue One went over budget, so it was more than what they thought because they had to declare all of this in the statements as well. Um, at the other end of the spectrum, Solo, um, which is Disney only lost making Star Wars movie during production of the 2018 Han, Fo uh, Han, Folo? Han Solo origin picture, directors Phil Lord and Christopher Miller were replaced with Ron Howard, who reportedly carried out extensive reshoots, causing costs to skyrocket. I bet that's a big regret they have now. Uh, the impact of this is revealed in the financial statements for the production company behind Solo, which says that the final cost was higher than the agreed budget. So, um, they obviously did get some money back on that. However, the movie bombed at the box office as the takings came to just 392.9 million, leaving Disney with an estimated loss of 90.7. This is not actually the worst of it, which we'll see in a moment, which is quite surprising. Aside from this loss, the accolade of the lowest profit and return of investment multiple um, in Disney's Star Wars series goes to the Rise of Skywalker. Even though the financial statements reveal that its costs were below the production budget, it's 112.4 million bottom line brings the total net profit from Disney's five Star Wars movies to date to 2.1 billion, which is 2.8 billion short of the purchase price for Lucasfilm. So when you factor in everything else that comes with making a movie, not just how much it makes, they're actually operating at a loss still. It's going to take them, based on this, it's going to take them a good few movies uh, still, most likely, to, to kind of break even. Uh, bearing in mind this little surprise that Disney's uh, presentation didn't work out the return of its acquisition of Lucasfilm by using the profits of the movies, as it's still got a long way to go just to break even. Of course, the calculation, now this is important to bear in mind as well, just to make it fair across the board. The calculation, of course, the calculation above doesn't include the huge profits Disney makes on the Star Wars merchandise, DVDs and Blu-rays. However, it also doesn't include the massive marketing costs of the movies, as well as the costs of Star Wars streaming shows and theme park attractions, which also don't have revenue streams directly connected to them, as visitors get all the rides for the price of a single ticket, essentially. And same with Disney+. Plus. When you get a Disney Plus uh, subscription, you can watch any of the shows on there. It's not just Star Wars. Uh, so they don't really allocate that amount to Star Wars. So likewise, the calculation doesn't include the results of the other Lucasfilm franchises. So it gets worse here. As we recently revealed, Disney lost 134.2 million at the box office on Indiana Jones 5. And um, Lucasfilm's streaming series based on 1988 fantasy film Willow was cancelled. Now that was just cancelled outright and it was removed from Disney Plus, if I'm right, despite the mouse pouring more than $100 million into it. So that couldn't have printed a pretty picture on their bank statements. Uh, Lucasfilm also owns the Industrial Light and Magic Visual Effects division, but that is far smaller than the flag, uh, flagship franchise. So overall, you know, if like me, you've probably heard online numerous times that, you know, these Star Wars sequel movies, they grossed a lot of the box office, and based on that, Disney have more than made up the money they spent on buying Lucasfilm. Well, actually, it isn't the case at all. When you dig into the nitty-gritty of it all, actually, they've still got a long way to go just to... Uh, even break even with it all even break even that's probably not right but uh, to break even with it all now you guys might not be too interested in this but some of you might be and for me when i found this i was kind of just blown away by it i was like wow um because for years i thought everything was kind of paid off in that respect they've made their money back but no they still got still got a long way to go um so we'll see we'll see how it all turns out sublight how you doing buddy good to see you what's up fam how are we all doing Good day, just Star Wars. Hope you're good, man. All good in the hood. All good in the hood over here. Uh, spent a lot of time, to be honest with you. The weather's been a bit better in the UK, so I've spent a lot of time in the old garden lately, getting my hands dirty, getting everything ready uh, for the summer. So let's uh, let's get in 
do let's talk about movies a little more rather than looking at movies that are come and gone let's look at movies that are still to come so we do have an update on one of the upcoming star wars movies and this uh, article is over on bespin bulletin so it goes on to say over the course of several months in its title daisy ridley reveals she's due to read a script for her Star Wars New Jedi Order movie next month. Over the course of several months, it feels as if Daisy Ridley has been given the same answer regarding the status of a Rey Skywalker fronted Star Wars movie being directed by Shemaine Abay Chinoy. It's usually something along the lines of she thinks it's the, Corey's, uh, the story is cool, uh, she knows certain elements, but she's been waiting to read a script. Now, this isn't a criticism of Ridley by any means, absolutely not. The actress has been busy this year promoting her films and the rest of it. Um, However, it now seems as if things are moving regarding the new Jedi Order movie, and Ridley is inching ever closer to finally reading a script to a movie she's atta been attached to for over a year. That's mad. So, like, the, the new Jedi Order movie is, like, announced over a year ago now. Um, wow. Doesn't seem that long ago. Uh, saying that, I was kind of thinking earlier on, can you believe it? We're coming up towards the end of the Bad Batch, and... Uh, you know, when we get to the end of the Bad Batch, we're going to be five months into the year already, which is uh, insane, nearly halfway. Um, so she goes on to say, I know the story beats, but other than that, I'm not sure what it's going to be, but I'm reading a script next month. I'm curious about it all. So she said that to uh, Empire Magazine. So I think they've done like a, a really big um, Star Wars bit for the month of, uh, was it this month or next month? Uh, Stephen Knight, the creator of uh, Peaky Blinders. Uh, is there anything new here? Uh, earlier this year, the insider Jeff Snyder reported that the Daisy Ridley-led New Jedi Order movie um, would follow The Mandalorian and Grogu and that the film is currently looking to release on December 18th, 2026. Um, Disney have yet to confirm the reports and it will likely be quite some time before they do. However, if they do, plans could easily change. Um, so it looks like the ball is actually finally starting to move on the uh, the Ray movie. It's easier just to call it out if I'm honest with you. Um, now, this script originally was meant to be done what was it? Uh, Thanksgiving 2023. Uh, I think this strip, uh, script was meant to be in. And obviously with the... That's due to the delays. That's due to all the delays that happened um, with the writers, the sag Afra strike, the rest of it. Um, so it looks like we're finally getting into it now. And it was actually meant to start... I believe it was meant to start filming um, around, this, around now, originally. Uh, but that's been pushed back to some point um later on this year and we're actually going to briefly touch on uh filming times and when we can expect certain things to release uh, because i came across something else that was uh pretty interesting to me um so it's probably going to be of some interest to you guys as well before we move on though i want to know the new jedi order movie the mandalorian and grogu movie which movie are you most looking forward to out of the pair uh for me For me, before Mando Season 3 came out, I probably would have said the Mandalorian and Grogu movie because Season 2 was uh, such a dope season overall. Um, at the moment, I'm probably a bit torn between the two. I'm probably a bit torn between the two. Um, it's hard for me to really separate, but I want to know where you guys sit with it. Which movie are you most looking forward to? We're, both get we're getting them both in the same year. Um, but with that being said, let's talk about years just briefly before we get into the bad batch stuff into the uh the fun of the bad batch huh? ah okay here we go uh yo what's going on joe good to see you buddy jedi order movie for joe over here jedi order movie for joe i'm interested to see what they're going to do with that Okay, so I was reading an article earlier on on Star Wars News Now, now we're not going to go through uh, the whole thing because it's really, really not needed for the exercise here and what we actually want to get to the, the point of. Um, but it's actually titled This Week in a Galaxy Far, Far Away, A Close Look at the Tentative Star Wars 2024 Calendar. Now, this is on the back of Outlaws, you know, the official story trailer being released last week. 
Um, and, you know, we got the announcement of Tales of the Empire as well recently. Now, uh, we can actually pretty much come all the way down here before we actually get to uh, what we want to talk about just here, okay, which we're going to do. Uh, before we do that, let me just quickly show you guys this. Uh, George Lucas, uh, which is nice to see. So, it's certainly not a major Star Wars development, and the runner-up for this week might be more interesting, but every time George Lucas makes any any sort of public statement, it's newsworthy to Star Wars fans, or to them. Um, I don't know how much he thinks about Star Wars on a daily basis, uh, but or whether he should have sold Lucasfilm to Disney or not. Um, but he's basically been awarded. He's got an award coming his way. Now... Here, okay. Um, he, he went on to say, I am truly honoured by the special recognition, which means a great deal to me. Now, that was George Lucas in his statement thanking the Cannes Film Festival for awarding him the honorary Palme Adore. Adore? Is it Adore? Ballon d'Or? Um, Palme Dor, um, which he'll be receiving on May 25th. Um, did this happen because someone noticed the Star Wars anniversary was on the same day as the closing ceremony of the festival? Maybe, maybe not. But for someone who has essentially reshaped the entire film's industry, it was long overdue. It's not an Oscar-level recognition, but to someone who appreciates cinema so deeply as Lucas does, it must really mean a great deal. Um, so, yeah, George Lucas is getting awarded with a... No reward, and obviously, you know, it's very much deserved, in my opinion. So let's get on to the tentative Star Wars 2024 calendar. Now... The big news this week was, of course, the release of a new story trailer for Star Wars Outlaws. It came with it a lot of side coverage. Video game fans may be delighted to know, but blah, blah, blah. Right, let's get into what we can expect then. Uh, so looking at the 2024 Star Wars calendar, at least for high-profile releases and excluding books and comics, which are a constant in time, it seems like Lucasfilm and their partners have managed to spread the load very well. If there was any sense of fatigue after dropping several live-action shows in a row, The Book of Boba Fett, Obi-Wan Kenobi, Andor, The Mandalorian and Ahsoka were all less than four months apart from each other, they decided to wait for The Acolyte until June. Seven months since Ahsoka wrapped, not uh, not rush it to make sure we don't forget that Star Wars exists, but also to not wait uh, so much that we actually do. In the meantime, though, to keep some momentum going, they dropped a 15-episode animated series in the Bad Batch. That's crazy to think about, isn't it? Like We're in the second longest stretch of time right now um, without a Star Wars live-action Disney Plus show since they started making them. Back in 2019, we're in 2024. Uh, the longest being the gap between The Mandalorian Season 2 and The Book of Boba Fett. Um, that was 12 months. And now we're sitting here, uh, seven, well, we'll be at seven months pretty much, apparently, according to this. I haven't done the maths, uh, which is the second longest time. So many people would call this a dry spell, if I'm honest with you, but it's going pretty well. Um, the Book of Boba Fett, Obi-Wan, Andor, The Mandalorian, and Ahsoka are all less than four months apart. That's insane when you look back on it like this. Um, so yeah, 15 uh, episode animated series, The Bad Batch, but that's not even it because they also had the card of a secret animated series they hadn't disclosed and which will be dropping on May the 4th this year. Tales of the Empire, of course. Then Leslie Headland and co will be over for The Acolyte, seven consecutive weeks until mid-July, at which point we're one in the final stretch before the release of Outlaws, which will be August the 30th, just a couple of weeks away from D23, the first week of August. Um, so D23 is coming out before Outlaws. That's uh, So we probably will get some more, more Outlaws updates uh, in D23, I guess. Um, and yeah, like it quite rightly says here, uh, well, I doubt we're going to get... Do you think we're going to get Tales of the Jedi Season 2 still, or do you think Tales of the Empire is what we're going to sit with now? Um, I personally didn't consider the possibility of Tales of the Empire being a completely different entity to Tales of the Jedi. I thought that was Season 2. I doubt we're going to get Tales of the Jedi Season 2 as well. I could be wrong. But yeah, and also we could get some updates or maybe even uh, a trailer of some kind in August uh, for Skeleton Crew. Um, Outlaws already puts us in the fall. 
We, uh, which is when we're expecting those two series. So I don't think we're going to get Tales of the Jedi Season 2, if I'm honest. Um, I'm a little uncertain about these, though. I'm expecting Tales of the Jedi to debut before Halloween. Whoa. We're not going to get a Tales of the Jedi. We're getting Tales of the Empire. Um, it seems pretty clear of all of the above that Skeleton Grill debut around Thanksgiving or Christmas since they're spacing out their live action releases. Yeah, by all accounts, I think we're going to be getting Skeleton Crew towards the end of uh this year um and then next year now next year on this article down here they say that they think we're gonna get andor season two in 2025 but they're not too sure on ahsoka now it does say that um ahsoka season two what does it say Ahsoka Season 2 is not filming before quarter 4 2024. Now, it's actually scheduled to to begin filming in quarter 4. So that could be October. So Andor Season 2 could begin filming in October. It could very possibly be ready for a late 2025 release. So it could be a very similar year to what we've got this year, where we're getting um, Acolyte as the summer release, which is in June, not too long away now. Um, and then you get Andor Season 2 towards the end of the year. And of course, 2026 is just going to be wild. We've got two Star Wars movies coming out in one year. That's going to be absolutely insane. Now, one question I have got, um, you know, this year, obviously, we've been very lucky. We've had the Bad Batch. It's run for 15 uh, episodes. It's been a long one. Look, it's going to finish in May. It started all the way back in February, which is insane to think. This is the last season of the Bad Batch. So are we going to get another animated show like the Bad Batch, Clone Wars, Rebel style next year? Or is it going to be a quiet year for Star Wars animation? Um that's something hopefully will get revealed pretty soon. Now, on the back of Rebels, I believe it was about six months, and then they released the next anime, or when, then they announced that they were doing the Bad Batch. We could get something around, um, something around Star Wars Day, maybe D23. Um, hopefully before the end of this year, we'll get confirmation that the next animated show's on its way. And uh, I bet it's going to be a venturous one. Um, I want to ask you guys, actually, as well. Uh, what next animated Star Wars show do you think they're going to come out with? What do you think it's going to be? Do you think it's going to be um, one following Asajj Ventress, maybe alongside Omega as well? Is it going to be something completely different? Are they going to go animation like that in the Old Republic, High Republic? Are they going to tell another story um, during the time of the Empire? Uh, let me know your thoughts. My thoughts, I'm firmly in the camp of Asajj Ventress is going to be the main character, um, possibly training Omega in some kind of capacity as well. Um, and it's going to be a show essentially based around their hidden path during the time of the Empire. Uh, I think that's the route they're going to go down. And I think it would make total sense. I think it would make total sense. You know, they're exploring one side of the... Uh, one side of the conflict, aren't they, with Palpatine and Project Necromancer? Well, if you think about it, the path, the hidden path, is a, a direct counter to that. The path is there to try and help get Force sensitives away from the Empire, including children, and Project Necromancer wants to bring them in. So it makes sense for me for them to explore both sides of uh, both sides of the argument there. So uh, fingers crossed for it, but I'm curious to know what you guys think on that as well. Okay, so let's uh, let's take a look. What have, what have we got planned next? What have we got planned next? Right, well, let's get into uh, let's get into Bad Batch territory, shall we? Let's get into Bad Batch territory. Oh, 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 oh! Before I forget, before I forget, um, who knows? Who knows? Um, what the next Star Wars big Star Wars game is going to be? Who knows what it's going to be? After Outlaws. Who knows? Um, if you don't know, let me know in the chat if you want to know. And uh, I might tell you. Okay, so uh, Pam Hill. Peace. How you doing? Hope you're doing good. Um, because it's about time I did something with Star Wars and with this Rey movie, she should or she could get a massive pay rise for this and possibly do like a series of it, serious of it. Um, so apparently she's getting like 15 mil, I heard. She's getting like 15 million for coming back in the uh, new Jedi Order movie, which is a massive pay rise from what she had um, in 
the force awakens maybe even in the rise of skywalker last jedi as well uh massive pay rise this is like a big big payday uh, not just for her time on star wars but also for her career overall um so it, you would have been silly not to come back, if I'm honest. Uh, Star Wars fans don't realize the bad Star Wars content gets outweighed by the good Star Wars content. Um, so I think the way I see it, you get some hit and misses. You definitely get some hit and misses. And we've had a few misses recently and, you know, in in the time of Disney Star Wars. But we've also had some good wins, in my opinion, as well. Um, Disney can blame itself for not making a uh, profit off Star Wars. Give the people good stories and stay true to the message. Um... At the end of the day, people like Star Wars because they like stories. People, human beings, love stories, right? So as long as the story is good, the people will be there for it. Um, it's, it's as simple as that. It kind of goes with what David said, doesn't it? Um, you know, if you give good content, make a good story, the people will be there. Um, they're going to uh, screw up the Jedi origin movie so bad rather than have a one about the Old Republic. You mean the... Um, you mean the Dawn of the Jedi, James Mangold movie? I don't know, man. I'm a little bit more optimistic on that one now that we know that Andor writer was in there. You know, initially with James Mangold, I was kind of thinking, oh, this is going to be kind of like, not plastic, but kind of weak a little bit. Um, but with the Andor writer going in there, who's responsible for some of the better episodes of Andor? Well, they're all pretty good, if I'm honest with you. Um, but some of the more memorable episodes of Andor, he's in there now for the Jedi Order movie. I'm interested to see what the two can do. I'm interested to see what the two can do. Um, you know, don't stick all your eggs in one basket with certain directors, um, creatives working on Star Wars that you like. Um, you've also got to explore what others can do as well. Uh, so I'm interested to see what the two new guys can do in Star Wars. Um, I don't think Vader will be in the Bad Batch unless he plays a role in the series final. Wow. Um, yeah. Imagine Vader being there. I don't think he will be. I don't think he will be. Maybe we could get more Palpatine. Um, I can't see Vader being in there. But it's not going to be long until we see Vader anyway. You know, he's going to be in Towns of the Jedi, which is going to be pretty cool. Um, I think we could get a show about Rex, Wolf, and Grigor. Uh, Disney would be foolish not to. We could possibly, although, yeah, I'm, I'm going to stick to my what I think on this one and go that they're going to say a Sarge Ventress um, and give her the uh, the next animated show. That's what I think they're going to do. Uh, a show about Wolf, Rex, and Grigor showing uh, Wolf's inhabitor chip getting removed. I mean, that... That could certainly be done. That could also be done. That could also be done in the Bad Batch, potentially, or is there not enough time for that? Um, hello, finally, I made it. Auntie Lissy, been a while. Hope you're doing well. Good to uh, good to see you. Um, good to see you. Hope you're all good. Okay, so should we talk about Bad Batch then? Should we get in? Should we recap the episode? Um, go through thoughts, theories, uh, thinking out loud on what we're going to get next week or this week now. Uh, that's what I mean. Like, time is moving so fast. Um, yeah, <laughs> I don't like it. Time is moving so fast. Oh, can I do this? Let me try this. Okay. Okay. Okay, so let's get the uh, episode up. And before we get into this as well, now looking uh, ahead to what we've got to come this year. So we've got well, the Bad Batch final. So let's remove the Bad Batch from the equation for the moment. But when we look at what comes after, Tales of the Empire. So from Tales of the Empire, the Phantom Menace re-release, the Acolyte, Outlaws, Skeleton Crew. Um, and I don't think I'm missing anything else off the top of my head. Which project out there are you most looking forward to out of the whole bunch? I want to see where everyone's attention, everyone's hype is focused on right now outside the bad batch because i know it's probably going to be there at the moment because we're coming to the crunch time so i can't actually for copyright reasons just play the episode but we can skim through sections of it which is totally fine apparently uh so we kicked off the episode on mount tantus as well something i noticed about mount tantus um during the daytime when i saw a shot of it during the day that I've never noticed before. 
there are actual other mountains with imperial bases in the background i think it's this one over here um i don't know if you guys can see you can kind of see it can't you on the screen if you look here you've got the rings carved into the mountain which are where ships land for example um in mount tantis uh, but if you look around here as well, there's also rings on this second mountain behind it. So there is more than one facility there. Whether that's classed as being part of Mount Tantis or not, I'm not sure. But it's just an interesting observation nonetheless. So we've got a uh, CX2 dropping Omega off now to Hemlock. Uh, she's going in. He gives her the whole talk. You never should have escaped. Blah, 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 blah. You've been very naughty. Um, the rest of it. Uh, this is interesting. You've got like Omega trying to appeal to Emery's better nature. Emery, I think we're all agreed on this, aren't we? We are, right? That Emery is going to flip over at one point um, and rebel against the Empire. It's just, it's in her DNA. It's in her DNA to, to not just play along with the Empire. She knows it's morally wrong what she's doing. Uh, we've seen her kind of question uh, their methods, especially when it comes to holding force sensitive kids. It's a matter of time until she flips, right? Uh, I mean, it will be the biggest, it will be the biggest shock um, in Star Wars animation ever if Emery um, decides to stick around for the Imperial ride and just stay quiet and get on with her work. Um, it would be such a shock. Um, I, I, does anyone think she's actually going to do that? I, I, I really think she's really going to uh, just, just flip over and she's going to be the catalyst to their escape. Um, I think with her help, Omega's going to escape. Um, the clone kids, the four, sorry, the four sensitive kids are probably going to escape, I think. Um, and they might even manage to, to rescue a few clone troopers in there as well, especially with the resources that Emery has at her disposal now being the, um, you know, the head of the, the project, essentially. So you've got the Bad Batch, they're still on Pabu. Obviously, Pabu is pretty much locked down at this point in time. Um, and Crosshair, quite oddly, uh, comes out with, oh, well, you know. <laughs> I know someone who might know where Mount Tantis is. Well, why didn't you say that earlier, mate? Honestly. Um, but obviously, Crosshair, you know, you got to cut him a little bit of slack. This guy went through a rough time at Tantis. He doesn't really care for the, uh, the, the, the moral mission of Rex and, you know, trying to get their own back and rescue the clones, the rest, uh, the rest of it, put a stop to what they're doing. Uh, he just wants to get the hell away from there. Um, as long as he's with, uh, you know, Clone Force 99 and Omega safe. He just wants out. He just wants out. He wants to get as far away from it as uh, as possible. Uh, so I don't really hold it against him too much, if I'm honest with you. And it doesn't look like the Bad Batch do. It doesn't look like the Bad Batch do. They kind of understand why he remained quiet. Uh, although it is frustrating. P pops out of nowhere as well. Um, being a pirate, she knows all the uh, smuggling tunnels, um, which you, know, you kind of would expect, I guess. Um, yeah, you kind of would expect that. But that gives the Bad Batch essentially a way off Pebu without being detected you know it's very much locked down um cx2 made it clear that he wants them taken out he doesn't want them there he's not just there for omega he wants to get rid of them too so they realize they've got to go and retrieve our guy So, oh, Admiral Rampart is being held up on a new planet. We've not seen the planet before. Um, yeah, do you, do you trust Rampart? Do you trust Rampart to, to kind of not stitch them up in a way? We'll get into the Rampart stuff in a moment anyway. I'm not too sure. You know, I, I don't trust him as far as I can throw the guy. Um, but also, he's not going to be that friendly with the Empire either, is he? So he would have motive, I guess, to, to potentially help the Bad Batch in whatever they're trying to do. There he is, still thinking he's a uh, top dog down there with the other prisoners. This is where the, uh, the Bad Batch essentially arrive and snatch him.
So he doesn't want to play ball. So he's only going to play ball if uh, they get in the hell off that rock, uh, which, of course, they, they're obliged to do. He's not really in a position to barter, but the, the Bad Batch are desperate, and he probably realizes they're desperate. That's why they've went to him. So he knows he's got a little something over him, even though he's in such a situation himself. I mean, he's Rampart the sort of guy to kind of buy into the cause and help the Bad Batch? Um, or is he just really the person to give them the information they need in exchange for something he wants? Obviously, safe passage away from the Empire, a chance to start afresh uh, under the radar, essentially. Or is it really going to, you know, grow on him, this whole fight against the Empire kind of thing, and we could see his story take on a different route? Um, how do you think that's going to go down? I personally, I think it's going to be... It, it, I mean, this episode reminded me very much of that Mandalorian episode with Bill Burr. Um, very much Rampart is acting as a similar player to uh, Bill Burr's character, who's... Uh, what was his name? Oh, what was his name? Bill Burr's character in The Mandalorian. Migs... 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 Migs Mayfeld, was it? Migs Mayfeld, I believe his name was. Um, so I think he's very much fulfilling the same kind of character. I wouldn't be surprised if his story ends the same way. Um, he has this heroic moment. He does the right thing. But ultimately, the deal's the deal. The Bad Batch get the information they want. Uh, Rampart gets what he wants from the bargain. They drop him off somewhere. That's it. We never see Rampart again. Would not surprise me if that's how it goes down. Which is okay, to be honest with you. I mean, Rampart, you know, was a... One of the main characters in um, in the earlier seasons, but this time around, you know, going into season three, I wasn't kind of sitting there thinking, I really want to see Rampart again. Um, but, you know, he's uh, played a good, important role in the story, so fair play. So we've got Omega here getting the confirmation that, yep, yeah, indeed, it is a... Uh, a correct positive it isn't a false positive as nada say did suggest um to hemlock earlier on so i wonder if we'll see the ramifications now reflected on nala say is she going to take additional punishment she's been locked up in the cell uh, but now um hemlock's got proof that she was out and out lying and she was discarding or perverting uh, pervert, pre pre preventing the uh, or whatever the term is um <laughs> the course of the imperial program to try and discover um the key to project necromancer uh, she was kind of preventing that and now they've got evidence of it so i wonder if they're going to uh, uh punish her any further perhaps execution that would that be outside the realms of possibility um or if it's just going to be left as it is but i mean this is the proof this is the proof that she was out like lying to him And uh, this is probably the best part of the episode, if I'm honest, uh, where you've got them walking down towards the vault together. So here's where Hemlock, he's spilling the beans to Omega. What is going on? What the whole idea of the operation is? Um, I mean, look, we, we don't learn anything new here ourselves for the most part, although we do learn something new, um, which I want to point out to you guys. I did put it into the breakdown. No one really commented on it. Um, and I've not really seen it spoke about anywhere else online at the moment. And I'm thinking, am I just misunderstanding this? Or is there a little bit more to it? So he's given her the rundown, you know, about the tests with the midichlorians, how, you know, they degrade over time. They haven't had a uh, successful match. They've tried mission, mashing, various combinations of their test subjects. No success. Uh, that is until... We added your sample into the mix. I mean, Omega's sample, not, not your sample, Omega's sample into the mix. Then they had success. What does that tell you? To me, that tells me that they have had a successful M count transfer with the equivalent or if not higher midichlorians um, match than the original donors. So, for example, um, the M count transfer going into potentially a clone body uh, did not degrade from the levels it were at when it was in the host, the organic M count holder's body. Now, earlier on in the season, we heard um, Hemlock tell Nala say um, that they have had a successful M count transfer. However, the M count levels were significantly lower 
than the donor's M count levels. Now, Nala say piped up and went, well, the Emperor will be happy we're making progress. And he went, well, actually, no, he won't be. I don't think so. Um, you know, they need to be the same or if not exceed the original M count levels, not be lower than them. That is not what we're looking for. So for him to say to Omega that we've had success indicates they've managed to get the same, if not a higher amount. And now they've obviously used her test that Emery uh, got on the day that Palpatine came in episode three. They've obviously used that test because it came back as a positive and they got a positive result. So have they just put it through the system and um, run tests um, in the tubes, for example, and yep, yes, it kind of holds? Or have they actually tried implementing this into a clone somewhere on Tantis? And potentially now we have a force sensitive or a high M count clone running around behind the scenes um, because they don't rule that out. And the way he kind of words it, it doesn't really suggest one way or the other it just uh, mentions they've had a level of success with it which they've never had before uh very interesting stuff so perhaps that's something that we could get picked up on in the next episode we'll have to see where that kind of leads us to So this is when you walk out. Now she's not seeing the uh, the vault room, essentially, or you know the uh, the the room with the cloning uh, cylinders in there. She's going to see the uh, the kids' room. Yeah, the uh, the worst of the two rooms, in my opinion. So these kids are the rest of the puzzle. So uh, from what we can learn from this episode is Omega's blood is essentially the the way I can see it. Think of it as. Uh, like a pizza all these four sensitive uh, four sensitive kids are the toppings okay um to go on the pizza okay so you've got your pizza base you got your uh tomato on the bottom on the base so you've got some barbecue and these kids are essentially the toppings they're the force going on the top um but they just slide off you need the cheese Omega is that cheese. And that's probably a really bad analogy. And I'm really sorry about it. But as to, for trying to explain how it kind of works, uh, I think that's the best way you can do it. Or if you look at it like that, they need something to bind the force to the hosts. Um, and Omega's blood is essentially that. Um, so she's part of the puzzle. She's one half of the puzzle or one third of the puzzle. They're a third. And obviously the clone base template, the body of the clone is the uh, the final third. Um, so essentially that's how it's going to play out now next episode what can I see happening um, I don't think we're going to get to Tantis next episode um, with the Bad Batch maybe we will towards the end or we will get uh, to the end of the episode and we'll get a clear idea of right okay next week we're going to Tantis um, this is when it all goes down um, but I don't think we're going to get there initially I think we're going to have another job with Clone Force 99 to find the location of Tantis, and that's going to be based off of the information um, that uh, Rampart tells them. Um, and I wouldn't be surprised if we get some developments on Tantis itself, especially with Emery. Maybe we get uh, more clearer signs of her intention to help Omega escape. Uh, but what I'll be interested to see as well is will we see Omega connect in some capacity with these children? Now, bearing in mind, Omega's met Force Sensitive in uh, Jedi Gunji, who's taught her the art of meditation. Now, meditation is key to harnessing the Force. You might think it's just there to sort of center, to focus the Jedi. But the more you meditate, uh, the more a Jedi meditates, the more connected they are to the Force. Now, the Force, the, uh, the midichlorians are in their blood. Uh, when they meditate, it can literally cause the midichlorians to... To increase almost because they become more attuned um, to themselves, to the midichlorians, everything around them. So, if Omega's coming into a group of force sensitives with that knowledge, she could literally teach him a thing or two, and maybe that could aid in their way off of Tantus as well. Um, but equally, if Omega does have some kind of force potential, perhaps she was injected with midichlorians back on Camino, then. Perhaps seeing and being around these four sensitive kids could have some sort of impact on her as well. Um, how do you guys think this next episode is going to go? So essentially, I think we're going to get some developments with the Bad Batch. I think they're going to get away to Mount Tantis come the end of the episode. Um, 
they have to do like a, a mini mission um, for Rampart or with Rampart to get that information. Um, I think we're going to see the pieces come together on Tantis with Omega, with Emery, and potentially these force sensitive kids as well. Um, and maybe we'll get a few secrets tossed in there for good measure for what's going on there other than Project Necromancer. There's bound to be other shady stuff going on. I would not be surprised at all um, whatsoever. Yeah, would not be surprised. Um, I'm getting more and more nervous about who will survive and who will die. Um, yeah, I, I, a lot of people are saying that, to be honest. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I think Omega's going to survive. I think she will. I mean, look, Tech... Um, I think Tech, personally, is DX2. Um, I think that will be revealed at some stage. Um, but I don't think Tech's going to make it, or CX2 is going to make it out of the show. Echo is um, officially not a part of the Bad Batch anymore, even though he's alive. Um, so if you're looking at Crosshair, you're looking at Hunter, and you're looking at Wrecker, I wouldn't be surprised if... I would not be surprised if uh, Hunter dies. I think Hunter might. I think Hunter might. I don't think Crosshair will. Um, I don't think Wrecker will. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if Hunter does. Um, and I wouldn't be surprised if Omega did eventually leave to go off with a character like a Sarge Ventress. That wouldn't surprise me at all either. Um, but yeah, that's a good conversation to have. Um, okay, so if you can pick one character... Well, let's do a poll on this, actually. Uh, let's do a poll on this. Eighty-one percent of you said yes. You did force choke the like button. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate that. Obviously, when you do like the streams, uh, you know it helps get it shown to more people, uh, gets the conversations flowing even more. And uh, yeah, happy days, happy days. Right, let's start this poll. Okay, so who do you think? Who do you think will die come the end of the Bad Batch? So we'll stick in Hunter, uh, Crosshair. Let's put in Wrecker. And Omega. So I'll pop that in there. We'll see how we go. I'm going for Hunter personally. Don't just go what I said. Put what you think in there. I mean, it could be devastating, couldn't it? It could be they all survive and Omega's the one that dies. That would be that would be quite a shocker, um, if you ask me. That would be quite a goddamn shocker. Maybe Omega will not make it. That would be shocking. Yes. Yes. That is exactly what I just said, Lizzie, but you sent that before I said it. So, yes, I agree with you. Um, at least the writer strike ended. Also, merchandising plays a big part in Star Wars success. In the final, who's the clone assassin? Everybody wants to know. That's what everybody wants to know. Um, I think it's tech. I think it's tech. Um, I'm actually working on a video right now, which is actually going into great, great, great detail on why I think it's tech. And I'm pretty sure once you watch it, It'll be out tomorrow. I'm pretty sure once you watch it, um, you will be pretty, pretty, pretty sure it's tech as well. Um, so keep an eye out for that one. Honestly, um, I really do think it's tech. I really do think it's tech. Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, Emery is a very soft-spoken female clone. Another thing is Rampart could become a rebel after he was in prison for how many months? Was it over 100 days like Omega? Because I remember he has a beard. Yeah, he's grown quite a nifty old beard there, isn't he? Um, puts my beard, it's not even a beard now, is it? It's more like stubble. Puts it to shame, absolutely. Um, yeah, I mean, it would be longer than Omega, wouldn't it? Because, uh, he, he, yeah, he um, got found out before her. Didn't he? I think. Did he get found out? Yeah, he got found out before that. 
and obviously Omega's been out for most of the season and he's still inside. So, uh, yeah, he's been in there longer than Omega. But the thing is, you, you'll either get Rampart come out fighting, whereas, you know, he's proper, you know, like, you know, forget the Empire. Let's let's keep it. Let's keep it uh, family friendly. Uh, he's proper forget the Empire. I don't like the Empire. Uh, I'm going to join the Rebel guys and, uh, you know, give them a taste of their own medicine. Or he's going to want to come out and kind of do a cross there a little bit. Kind of, as I was saying, go back to the Mandalorian. Uh, kind of doing what... Um, what Bill Burr's character was doing in Mando season two, what was it, episode seven, was it, I believe? Um, where he just wanted to get dropped off and get the F out of there. He didn't want to mess around and dance in the wrong way with the Empire. Um, I think Rampart's going to go that way, but he could very well, you know, come out swinging as well. Oh, well, no. Well, hi. Oh my God. Hi, Sting Ray Z. Good to see you. Hope you're doing well. And uh, yeah, thanks for watching the video. And uh, thanks for checking out the stream. It's great to see you. Um, hope you're doing well. Um, that tells me Omega is clone Jedi material. We've seen her meditate since she ran into Gunji. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I. That is another theory I've got. So my top theories for the Bad Batch have to be CX2 is tech. Omega does have midichlorians to a decent level. I'm pretty sure she's had them the whole way through the Bad Batch ever since she was on Kamino. I'm pretty sure. I mean, and that, you know, even a Sarge Ventress coming along and saying she doesn't have a connection to the Force, that doesn't rule out that she doesn't have midichlorians. Midichlorians don't instantly give you that connection to the Force. You have to build it, you have to grow it, you have to nurture it uh, within yourself. Obviously, she's never had that. You know, she's never been trained. But equally, if she has metachlorines, it's not been given naturally. Um, it's artificial. So, it's going to behave a little bit different. It would not surprise me if she does. It just needs to be fostered and nurtured. Um, and I think Asajj is going to be the one to do that after the Bad Batch. Uh, but yeah, I think that they're my two top theories. I've got a few more, but they're the two big ones, I think. Um, and it's actually, I saw some fan art earlier on. Uh, someone's actually done some concept art of Omega as a Jedi. Pretty interesting. Just like wearing a mixture of the, uh, you know, the typical Jedi kind of uh, outfit, um, but it's got a clone trooperish twist to it. Yeah. It was quite cool. Um, that tells me Omega is clone. Uh, done that one. Lansky, can that be Ray's father? Um, the successful M count sample. No, it couldn't be Ray's father. Um, Ray's father, Daffin. Now, that's an interesting one, Daffin. Uh, he didn't have midichlorians or, or the Force at all. Um, he had no aptitude for the Force. Palpatine actually called him the, the Abomination, which is pretty harsh. Um, the only reason he kept him alive is because, you know, even though he didn't have the Force, he still had that Palpatine blood. That pa He was a clone of him. So he still had that blood, flesh, you know, the tissue, that Palpatine DNA, and he thought that might come in handy someday um, if he ever needed any materials that he could no longer provide, you know, if his body was gone. Now, we did earlier on in the season hear that they had a uh, an M count transfer, but that was also unsuccessful. So that could be um, that could be Daffin, absolutely. That could be Daffin, that one there. Um, the second time round, where it's where it was successful, I don't think that would be Daffin. But that's kind of wild, isn't it? Like, so Daffin like lived on um, Exegol for a chunk of time. Now I don't know a ton about him, but I know a little bit, um, and maybe some of you know a little bit more as well about this. Uh, but Daffin, like a Palpatine clone, cloned him as part of Project Necromancer. Um, with the view of him being force sensitive, Palpatine can then transfer his essence into Daffin. Didn't work out. He came out normal. Um, he kept him alive because, you know, Palpatine was like, look, you've got this Palpatine blood. The rest of it will keep you alive. You'll be my son, essentially, but you are an abomination. You know, I don't even like you. Um, you can live as an animal in uh, Exegol for all I care. Um, he eventually escapes. That's just, that's just crazy. Um... I mean, I would actually be interested to find out a little bit more about that story, if I'm honest with you. It reminds me of the scene in the first Matrix film where a woman tells Neo about potential people who are just developing their powers. 
Yeah, it's kind of similar, man. Kind of similar. Um, it would be awesome, so awesome to see Omega use the Force. Could you imagine if she did? That would be uh, that'd be pretty crazy, wouldn't it? I mean, um, I don't know. I mean, look, th th there is evidence there that she does have uh, potential with the Force, you know, and I think evidence could have been there throughout the entirety of the Bad Batch. I mean, look, let's take a, a more recent example. Let's look at Batcher, her connection to Batcher. Literally, in that Asajj Ventress episode, Asajj literally explains that, you know, Force sensitives do have a connection to creatures, to animals. They can pick up on each other pretty well, as she did with that big uh, giant monster. Um, Omega's literally been doing that throughout the entirety of season three with Batcher, who by all accounts is a wild lurker hound. You know, he's not tame. You know, these 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 creatures are there um, to kind of take on the beasts on Tantis. Um, these aren't tame pets. Omega just bonds with it just like that. That could in itself be a force ability that she's displaying without realizing it. Um, I mean, let's look at when she was uh, trying to get the money to. Um, what was the money? What was the money for earlier in the episode where she had to gamble and she was gambling against the Imperial officer? Well, what was that money for? Was it for transport to get off world, wasn't it? Um, I mean, potentially there you could say that was down to her time, you know, playing the playing the games and whatnot. Um, but that could also be an element of her displaying force potential too um there's there's various bits and pieces throughout her meditating you know i mean that if there is metachlorians in there that's only going to help nurture and foster it and, and help it grow within her um if her blood is able to hold metachlorians then she's always going to have that potential she just needs the injection um i think personally she's had that injection i think she had it way back on camino uh, you know, Nala Say clearly knew she had potential about her. Um, that's why she was preventing the Empire test in her blood. But how would she know she had that potential if the Kaminoans weren't working on a project similar to that? They designed her for that purpose. And if they designed her for that purpose, wouldn't they have wanted to test their theory? Okay, so they designed Omega. All right, they don't know if if what they've designed her for is actually successful or not without testing it. So potentially she's got midichlorians within her already. I mean, is that a test that the Empire would even conduct? Would they even conduct a test to see if she has midichlorians? I mean, they've already got the Force Sensitive kids. They don't need midichlorians. They need a host that's able to hold them. I don't think they've been testing these clones for M counts at all. Um, I mean, why would they? They all share the same base template. Shouldn't they all be non-Force Sensitive? So uh, yeah, I think the potential is definitely there. I think Crosshair might not make it to the end, um, and it's so scary. Do you not think he will? Do you not think he will? I was kind of in that boat as well, you know. I was kind of thinking in that boat as well, thinking maybe this is the end for Crosshair. Um, I don't know. I'm not so much in that boat now. I don't know why. I think it's just how his story's unfolded a little bit. Um, but, but yeah, it could still happen. All of them could be wiped out, as, uh, as you quite rightly mentioned. Um... Omega could be all alone, or maybe she could go off with Ventress. I mean, could you imagine that? Like, Hunter's last words to Omega being, find Ventress. That would that would be one hell of a setup for, a, for the next animated show. As I just hit the mic, I do apologize. Um, what about Cody? I mean, he could be part of the final episode. I guess he could kind of fit in there. The final episode is called The Cavalry Arrives. Um, what cavalry is that? I mean, could that be the Bad Batch? You'd have to think. We're going into episode 13. You'd have to think. I mean, I'm kind of just estimating or kind of guessing here. But you would think episode 13 is going to be about how the Bad Batch get to Tantis. You know, um, following up on grandpa's idea and how he thinks you can get there and find the information for it so i think episode 13 is going to be that i think episode 14 is going to be the bad batch arriving on tantus attempting to rescue omega they're going to get themselves in a whole lot of trouble they're going to need help um and then episode 15 the cavalry arrives where you do get people to come in and kind of save the day and help them get out as well um 
maybe maybe cody could be a part of that wouldn't surprise me uh to be honest but also ventress could be in there as well um so many so many could be in there potentially i mean that being said it could actually be the cavalry arrives is the bad batch but i think the other option of having some other people outside of the group come in to save the day is a little bit more exciting uh, let's check out this poll anyway so 50 percent of you wow 50 percent of you are going across there um hunter 33 so hunter 33 um and wrecker 17. I mean, killing killing Wrecker would just be cruel and mean. And um, totally something they might do this season, if I'm honest. This season's been a bit darker uh, than I expected. So it could be something they do. Omega, 0%. Yeah, I don't think Omega's going to go. But what's interesting, there was an interview not long ago, wasn't there? Where um, the, the voice actress who, who, who does the voice for Omega mentioned that they created alternate endings for the bad batch um and one particular ending set up omega to be an integral part of star wars not just in animation but you know all over going forwards um but that ending was scrapped um but the ending they do get is bittersweet now that could just completely be misdirect but that's what the uh that's what the the actress who brings omega the life i guess well the voice actress for omega um that's what she had to say on the matter so we have got some other uh bits and pieces up here as well now after i finished last week's stream it kind of dawned him as like ah oh, i wanted to go through this ah oh, i wanted to go through that so i'm going to be careful not to miss anything again i don't know why but last week's stream really 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 tired me out Got really tired after it for some reason. Anyway, so before we move on, what are your thoughts? What are your predictions on next week's uh, Bad Batch episode? Drop them in the comments as always as well. Let's get that conversation going. Okay. As uh, we kind of briefly touched on um, earlier on, there has been a big, big, big um, edition of the Empire magazine um, this time around. Last time we had one of these, uh, not too long ago, we had one for the Star Wars prequels. Pretty cool. Uh, this time around, it looks like it is Acolyte based. So uh, let's go and check this out. See what's uh, see what's going down. So this is uh, over on Star Wars News Net as well. They have summarized the whole thing. Now, on this one, I haven't actually got this edition of Empire Magazine, but I will be going to the shop tomorrow. We'll check it out. And if it's there, I will get it to have further reading. But for now, uh, let's skim over some of the uh, the more important details. So new images for Star Wars Jackalite have been revealed in the latest issue of Empire Magazine, along with plenty of interest in bits of information from the outlet in their massive coverage of the series. Snippets from their big article have been making their way online over the past week, but with the issue now available, more images and quotes are available for us to dissect. Uh, so this is one of the pictures we got from the article there. The series is described as a mystery thriller, and Leslie Headland is already on record talking about how it will be a slow build, with each episode adding more information and keeping the audience guessing. So kind of maybe like an Andorish style then uh, but co-lead Lee Jung Jae who plays Jedi Master Soul in his first major role since his Emmy win for Squid Game added that it's going to get sorry it's going to get even more intriguing and gripping because of the detective genre his pad one is Jackie Lon who's played by Daphne Keane is this character I'm pretty sure there um, who describes her as a Jedi uh, David Bowie Jeki is apparently much more competent than Jedi Knight Yord Fander, um, Charlie Barnett. The two are seen in their header image in a snowy environment, seemingly investigating something she added. Uh, so could that be... Isn't, isn't that just a bit we got from the trailer when that red lightsaber goes, uh, goes towards him? No? We also got a, a new shot of the confrontation between Jedi Master 
Indara, Carrie I. Moss, and May, Amanda Stenberg, as an assassin, as seen in the first trailer. Moss told Empire where it was uh, working with Leslie Headland. It felt that a few times in my career were some of the big things that I've done, Memento and Matrix, where you're talking to the filmmaker and you just go, oh, they totally get it. You know it so well that I trust them. Speaking of the devil, we also got a new behind-the-scenes shot with Stenberg and Headland, who directed the first two episodes in what seems to be the outside of the tavern where May and Endura force Fu fight it off. This was shot in Shinefield Studios in the UK. Uh, the character of May was apparently inspired by Kill Bill's Go-Go. Uh, I've actually watched Kill Bill, but it was actually like a really, really long time ago, so I can't actually remember too much of it. Um, but there are more references to draw from, as Amanda Sturberg explains. One of my references was Go-Go from Kill Bill. Um, I've always loved that character. We also uh, thought about Joan of Arc, um, Ethiopian tribes, Renaissance garb. There was something very tough and very feminine about it at the same time. We wanted this character to feel both disciplined and have a sense of freedom and an expressiveness to her. Um, the Headland said multiple times that the Acolyte will have a focus on female villains as it has to these days um, and that it will be a stiff led story and so on now she insisted once again that she wanted to tell a story from the perspective of the bad guys so she left off that it'll be a focus on the female villains potentially so so does that mean the uh the the person we see in the trailer you know, you get that shot in the trailer where you've got Amanda Stenberg's character looking out to the horizon um, and you've got the figure in the horizon and you're just kind of looking at it thinking, who is that? Uh, does that mean that that is going to be a female Sith Lord then, potentially? Um, I was kind of looking at it thinking, wow, that must be Plagueis but, or, or someone, someone like that, but maybe not. Maybe it's someone completely new. Um, I was driven to write... <clears throat> but if we remember... If we remember back, actually, to the early leaks of the Acolyte, and of course, this could change um, because this is we're going way, way, way back, probably some years now. Uh, but the early, early initial leaks were that this character of May um, was found and fostered or taken on by a stiff lord who was a male, um, if I'm right. So they didn't disclose any other information on who it was. Um, I don't know if that's still relevant to the story. I mean, looking at these trailers, you can't get that vibe, but I could be wrong. I was driven to write a story that essentially was from the perspective of the bad guys. I write that way with my other work. I'm always attracted um, to immoral or immoral characters and finding humanity within the villains. Below, we have a new look at perhaps what... So they're going to be like anti-heroes, maybe? You can't have the Sith be anti-heroes, surely. At least not all of them. Maybe a new character like May. Um, you can't you can't really mess with that side of Star Wars too much though. George Lucas always wanted it to be very clear cut. There you good guys. There you bad guys. Um, I know you do get some grey, but for the most part, I think you have to be very clear on who's good and who's bad. Um, below we have a new look at perhaps one of the most intriguing characters from the Acolyte so far. Jodie Turner Smith plays Force Witch Mother Anisea Anisea, who belongs to a different coven than the Night Sisters of Dathomir. She said about them, they're really trying to preserve their beliefs and their powers and their independence. So we don't know these coven, uh, this coven of witches before. Like we know the ones from Dathomir, um, but we have no idea who these are. So something probably happens. Well, do you think something happens to them? It's not guaranteed. Um, but potentially something happens to them before we get into the era of the prequels um, and the Clone Wars, where they're not around. So could they have had a big off fight with the Witches of Daphimir? Or maybe they are still out there yet to be discovered. Uh, below, another look at Jackie Lon training inside the Jedi Temple on Coruscant. It appears that this is the same room as the training room seen in Star Wars prequel trilogy, just given a different set of aesthetics, befitting the fact that this show takes place 100 years prior to episode one. Um, Amanda Stenberg is a fun fact, looking up on the set of the Je Jedi Temple, uh, blah, 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 blah. Uh, got another shot here. Blow is another behind the scenes shot of Headland with Lee Jung Jay. That's down there, sorry. Um, May gazes upon a world of shadowy secrets.
So he's the, he's the um, he's the guy with the yellow lightsaber in um, in the trailer, isn't he? And this looks to be May Amanda Stenberg's old master when she was training to be a Jedi, potentially. I don't know. It's kind of confusing, and I think a part of this confusion has come from the leaks that we've had. Um, they seemed so you know um, detailed on the story, um, but as we've learned over the years of talking about Star Wars, when it comes to leaks, leaks can be true. From a certain point of view, I'm joking. From a from a certain time, they can be true. I mean, look at Ahsoka, for example. Everyone was hell bent that we're going to get Ahsoka fighting Anakin on Mustafar. Obi Wan's burnt like a crisp in the corner, dead. Um, of course, that never happened. Now that was a, it originally intended to happen, but it just never played out that way. Um, equally, with the uh, the Mandalorian season three, there were a lot of leaks for the Mandalorian, and Boba Fett was apparently meant to appear at some point but that was all scrapped as well so um you know these things do change um i think go into it uh not expecting too much of course if we hear, hear any more updated leaks before it drops then uh we'll, we'll chat about them for sure um but if not go into it don't try and uh, think about the old leaks too much just go into it with a clear head um and, and see what happens because the leaks could really mislead if i'm honest because they probably they came out so long ago um, I, I bet not all of them are, are, are bang on the money now. I bet they're not all bang on the money now. Yeah, absolutely. Uh. So we're still looking solid. 50% uh, for Crosshair is going to be the one to go out this season. I mean, that would be a real tearjerker. That would be a real tearjerker, I have to say. Um, I think Crosshair sacrifices himself for Omega and Hunter and Wrecker live, says Italian. Um, do you guys think Hemlock will make it out alive? I vote no. Yeah, Hemlock's no way is Hemlock getting out alive, man. He's gone. He's toast. Um, no way. No way. Well, that being... Yeah, no, he won't get out alive. Project Necromancer will stay, and that will still be a thing. There's no stopping that. Someone else would just step in to take place. Well, clone commandos have had a lot of training that allows them to survive longer than the average reg clone because of uh, the Catan armor. That is... That is... Uh, that is true, David Cohen. That is true, my friend. Um, I hope we get Echo back. Maybe they're saving Echo. Maybe they want Echo to survive, so he's got to stay away from Clone Force 99. Maybe. I mean, I hate to say it, but that is a possibility. I mean, look, they've already done it with Tex Goggles. Have you noticed how they um, removed them from the Marauder just before it got blown up? Have you noticed that? Um, it's no coincidence. It's no coincidence. Um... Janet Barney, I heard of that actor. She played Korra in Legend of Korra. I haven't seen Legend of Korra, if I'm honest. Um, I take your word for it, though, man. I absolutely take your word for that one. Uh, when does Acolyte take place in the timeline again? So I can confirm it's actually 100 years. Um, I wasn't sure on this myself. Uh, it's actually 100 years before the Phantom Menace. Now, um, originally, they were quite vague with the whole timeline. And reports started coming out saying oh well it's somewhere between 50 and 100 years before the phantom menace uh it's yes yeah, um it's confirmed now it's uh 100 years uh before phantom menace now there is something else there is something else when it comes to the acolyte now, I'm really curious to uh, to hear what the wider Star Wars community thinks about this. Um, now, this kind of feels like something we hear almost every time they release a new Star Wars project. Uh, take a look at this. So, again, we're on Star Wars News Now. And to be honest, like, we don't really look at many Star Wars News Now articles, but they've done some pretty good ones um recently uh the acolyte is aiming to beat the phantom menace lightsaber jewels now we hear about this every single time when they release the star wars show it's that these star wars lightsaber jewels are going to be next level they're gonna be it 
I mean, sometimes they're really good jewels, um, but they just don't live up to some of the older stuff we've got. Um, the cast and crew of the Acolyte are putting a lot of importance in their lightsaber fights, it seems. Daphne Keane has gone on record saying they wanted to film a lightsaber duel that was superior to Duel of the Face, one of the most famous lightsaber battles in all of Star Wars. Uh, fight sequence between Obi-Wan, Qui-Gon and Maul in The Phantom Menace. Um, speaking to Entertainment Weekly, she said, that was a very frequent conversation we had. It was very much, we want to top the Darth Maul fight. The most iconic fight, I think, in the Star Wars cinematic universe. It's such an amazing fight. And we're all so excited about the lightsaber fights. There's such a skill and craft to it that it feels so OG Star Wars and feels so impressive when you see it as a viewer. It was my favorite part of filming. I loved the whole training process of it. Everyone was very excited about it, which made it more, uh, made it much more fun. Our incredible stunt team created this kind of fusion to different martial arts, and we were really trained in how to use lightsabers. I felt very comfortable with a sword now. Well, so I feel very comfortable with a sword now. And I know that Charlie does too. And I know that JJ does too. We were all in there for hours a day training. And it was really fun to keep, uh, to kind of explore also a different side to the characters with, uh, within the fighting. Now, I have to admit, like if I was ever in a um, Star Wars show, movie, something like that, uh, that would 100% be the best part of filming, wouldn't it? Just getting the uh, the lightsaber training in there and, uh, and the duel and the sparring. You can show a different aspect of your character. I feel like uh, the way JJ's character fights and the way that my character fights are completely different. And also with the way that Charlie's character fights, um, they're called like forms, aren't they? <laughs> I guess. Uh, lightsaber fighting forms. Um, I found a lot of Jackie's repressed parts of her within her fighting. They only came out in the fight scenes. And then someone who really enjoys doing stunts, getting to learn a new skill, it's just really... Um, it was... Just really, just really, and they've repeated that there, fun and such a privilege. Um, the young actress also revealed the following. I got told off for doing that quite a bit because the first few times you do it and they'd be like, you need to stop doing that. Doing what? Oh, making lightsaber sounds with their mouth when filming. Uh, apparently quite a common thing they do when filming Star Wars shows. Hayden Christensen, um, Ewan McGregor, they, they spoke about doing it uh, during Kenobi as well. Uh, it's kind of funny if I'm honest with you. I mean, we've all done it, haven't we? We've all done it. When we've had the, the lightsabers, when we're kids and that, um, just waving around, vroom, vroom. Everyone does it. Um, so why wouldn't you do it when you're, when you're swinging around a real thing, I guess? Um, you do it and you'd be like, you need to stop doing that. And also I kept smiling. I was so excited and they kept having me come up, uh, kept having to come up to me and be like, Daphne, you need to stop smiling. You're fighting someone. And I'd be like, oh yeah, I'm sorry. This is just so fun. I love this. Um, I remember watching Star Wars when I was a kid, then playing with sticks on the street and being like, I have a saber. And now I finally get to learn these incredible choreographies that the stunt team put together it was just honestly such a privilege because we had such an amazing stunt team. Yeah, I wonder like as well, like if we'll see any differences between the, the style of um, lightsaber fighting in the time of the, whole Repu old Republic, uh, the High Republic um, and where we are in the prequel trilogy. I wonder if I see a difference in styles. Um, that'd be interesting to see. Uh, June the 4th, that comes out. So not long, too long now. Uh, right. I think that is... I think that is us. What's that? Well, we're whopping one hour and 36 minutes. Well, we've beaten last week's stream already. So... Uh, happy days um so what we're going to do now guys i'm going to love you i'm going to leave you uh, but first of all i'm going to thank you for chilling in the stream uh getting involved and if you didn't get involved well thanks for just chilling out um it's been appreciated and uh well, i hope you had a bit of fun i hope you found it a little bit informative um and uh yeah it was good chilling with you guys i will be back same time same place next week where we'll be looking at the Bad Batch, episode 13. Also looking ahead to episode uh, 14 as well. Um, for those of you that didn't hear it in the last stream on May the 4th, we've got a big day. We've got Star Wars Day, the release of Tales of the Empire. Um, now, I myself, I'm going to check out The Phantom Menace on its re-release. Um, 
It's one of the few Star Wars movies I've not caught in the cinema before, in the theaters before. Um, so I'm dragging myself down there for sure. 100% Saturday afternoon to check it out. But Saturday morning, um, I'm going to be streaming again. I'm going to be doing like a special like Star Wars Day stream um, where we're going to literally kind of do a long one. It's probably going to be maybe three, four, maybe five. I don't know how many hours long it's going to be. It could be a fairly long one. We're going to start um, when... Well, just before Tales of the Empire's release, we're going to watch Tales of the Empire together online, live. Um, and then we're going to kind of go through it bit by bit where we can. Um, and also react to any other cool, amazing, weird, not so good Star Wars announcements that might come out on May the 4th as well. Now, there's bound to be some more information. We might even get another trailer for the Acolyte so we can react to that live. It'll be good fun. Um, so May the 4th. If you want to come in, check it out. Stick it in your diary. And... Uh, yeah until then guys i will catch you in the next stream but before that it'll be in tomorrow's video so uh i'll catch you later may the force be with you 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 right, fade out fade out the voice you you